Hey everyone, we've got a hardware news recap leading into Computex for 2019. We just landed in Taipei yesterday as of filming, and there's a lot of big news items before the show, including Intel's new roadmap, looking at PCIe Gen 5 already, and DDR5 leading into 2021, and tech companies cutting ties with Huawei, Samsung being dethroned as one of the as the largest semiconductor manufacturer by Intel, the once Kane, largest semi, uh, semiconductor manufacturer. And then some news on HPE acquiring Cray. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake C360 DDC hard tubing water cooling kit. If you're ready to dip your toes into the water and build your first open loop cooling system, the Thermaltake C360 DDC hard tubing kit comes with all of the components you need to get started so you won't have to worry about forgetting anything. The kit includes a 360 millimeter radiator, three 120 ARGB fans, a copper W4 ARGB water block for the CPU, a pump and res DDC combo, and all the fittings needed to build a full CPU open loop. The hard tubing kit also gives a great launching point at a lower price to get into open loop building and expandability and can easily be grown with a GPU block if so desired. Learn more at the link in the description below. So as stated, we're here in Taipei. We're starting Computex coverage early next week or in a couple days from when this video goes live and you'll want to check back for that. We have a lot of uh, motherboard coverage lined up relating to AMD's announcements, AMD announcement coverage coming up, and then uh, probably no real discussion on GPUs, but we'll see what comes out and if there's anything on Navi. For this past week, Intel's server roadmap is looking at DDR5 and PCIe Gen 5. There's a, a screaming bird to my left off camera probably picking up on the mic. Enjoy that, uh, that serenade. So a recent server roadmap was leaked from a Huawei presentation for a bout of irony, as you'll see later in the episode, and it outlined some serious IO advancements for Intel's upcoming uh, technology. So 2022 data center roadmap is what we're looking at for this, but that is the predecessor to what eventually comes down to other Intel platforms like in mainstream desktop use for enthusiast desktop. And these include new code names for Sapphire Rapids and Granite Rapids, and then uh, both set to succeed the Cooper Lake and Ice Lake processors in the server segment with Ice Lake still kind of in the eventually it will roll out phase. Sapphire Rapids SP seems poised for a first quarter 2021 launch if Intel can stick to the roadmap. And that brings with it DDR5 memory support and PCIe Gen 5 support as you all likely know by now, PCIe Gen 4 was first supported with AMD's server processors and the platform that accompanied them, and will be next supported by AMD's mainstream desktop platform for the Ryzen 3000 launch coming up this summer. Uh, so uh, PCIe Gen 4 has been in the news. Gen 5 is up next, but really it's just increasing in bandwidth incrementally. That data is already out there on how much it increases. We can throw it on the screen. It's easily found on Wikipedia, but Gen 4 versus Gen 3, you had about a 2x increase in bandwidth per lane. So uh, DDR5 also in the news for that, but Sapphire Rapids will make use of the Eagle Stream platform, a uh, 2P machine platform that will also be used for Granite Rapids. No word on core counts or frequencies for Sapphire Rapids yet, but Sapphire Rapids will be succeeded by Granite Rapids in 2022, and that could bring with it a generation over generation improvement in silicon clock speeds and efficiency as one would expect. It appears that both processor families will come out with the Intel seven nanometer nodes, assuming 10 ever comes out, we can work our way towards seven. And it would be Sapphire Rapids based on Intel's first generation of seven nanometer. And then Granite Rapids would likely leverage a seven nanometer plus version because Intel is committing further to the uh, plus demarcations in their process nodes. So as things roll forward, you're going to see a lot more of what we saw with 14 nanometer where it's plus and then plus plus because Intel has been focusing on iterating on its process nodes to get more out of each node. And uh, to be fair, 14 nanometer was pushed really far. So Intel's keeping with that approach. Tech companies cutting ties with Huawei amidst the uh, US-China tensions. So in what's been an unprecedented move in both the tech sector and the Android landscape, Huawei has found itself on a commerce trade blacklist 
compliments of the U.S. federal government. Following Huawei's addition to the entity list, several important companies have been forced to sever ties. Among the most critical are Google and Arm, which will absolutely cripple Huawei's ability to ship phones and other Android devices. Google announced that it will revoke Huawei's Android license, thus limiting Huawei to using the Android Open Source Project, or AOSP, without access to Google's proprietary services like the App Store or the Play Store, uh, being Apple and Google there. This would make any fork of AOSP unrecognizable and limits the usefulness, especially in the Western markets. Huawei has already come out and stated that they have an OS ready. Huawei uh, apparently anticipated such a move, so it's got an OS internally ready for use. This would likely see more success in China, where the, the leading application is WeChat, including for payment of things. Uh, so beyond that, it probably wouldn't have as much pickup in the Western markets, which would do depend on either the App Store from Apple or the Play Store from Google. And this would be uh, Google since they've been Android devices up till now anyway. So among the uh, other news from this, Huawei has silently been working on its OS as the company anticipated losing Google. And losing ARM is, however, uh, nothing short of devastating. This one was a little less expected. Nearly every chip inside a smartphone or a tablet is based on ARM designs and without some foundation or IP on which to base the chips, Huawei's chip building ambitions are effectively dead. Also on the growing list of companies turning away from Huawei is Intel, and then along with them Qualcomm, Broadcom, and Xilinx, all pledging not to supply the company until further notice. Huawei has suggested it could replace its American suppliers with those found in China, but that's dubious as a claim to say the least. There's a chance that Huawei could potentially replicate some components, but it's unlikely that it could be done at the scale and the speed Huawei would need to do it at to recoup their upcoming losses. And this is the second largest phone maker in the world behind Samsung, so it's a big deal. More to the point though, Huawei needs to uh, needs access to the software, the IP, and the technology that is developed by its American firms. So we'll have more coverage on how this develops, but in addition to that, the Huawei ban in the US uh, has caught other tech companies in the crossfire for revenue losses. Due to Huawei's existence on the trade blacklist now, several American suppliers are expecting losses, including AMD, Intel, again, Qualcomm, Broadcom, uh, with some being a bit more exposed than others. AMD, for example, has more exposure despite having a lower absolute figure of revenue loss than, say, Intel. AMD's got more exposure to it because it's a greater percentage of AMD's total revenue. Intel's revenue loss is looking at somewhere around $85 million, which is uh, let's see, it is about 1% of its total revenue, so not a huge hit to Intel. AMD is looking to lose about $39 million, and then uh, Microsoft is up there in the nearly $30 million range as well. Broadcom, however, stands to lose the most revenue from the loss of Huawei as a client, and that's at $508 million, but Broadcom's exposure is, is far from the highest. It's their they're doing better than some of the others here. NVIDIA is on the list as well. So is Microsoft. Uh, the early estimates, and Goldman Sachs is, is involved in this for what that's worth, but the early estimates point to an $11 billion loss for the American suppliers collectively. Next up, Intel ending Samsung semiconductor reign. We previously reported on when Intel uh, was surpassed by Samsung as the most popular or the largest growing semiconductor manufacturer in the world, where Intel has, up until then, reigned supreme for decades. But uh, that's flipped again. So as IC Insights reports, Intel is once again the number one semiconductor vendor in the world, dethroning Samsung, which uh, dethroned Intel for the crown in 2017. So it took about two years to catch back up. This is in no small part thanks to the abrupt downturn in the DRAM market. You've likely seen this in DRAM prices finally coming down and uh, offsetting Intel's CPU shortage, which Intel is also getting uh, back on top of. So for, for second half of 2019, Intel CPU shortage should be effectively over from what we've heard. For Samsung, the writing has been on the wall for some time now. DRM market's pretty predictable and moves in waves. The company went as far as warning its investors in the first quarter uh, 2019 revenue report that it's greatly missing its mark due to massive price declines in memory. Samsung's lead was built on the massive memory business it was enjoying during the several quarter uh, of booming memory prices and this is something that we looked into extensively. In fact, almost every weekly news episode had discussion of memory prices for probably about a year. So Intel's propulsion back to the top was almost expected here, and it's one that Intel 
has has been struggling to find with 10 nanometer issues and shortages in CPU supply, especially for 14 man nanometer, but it is coming back. And uh, this this may be something to return to the default position for Intel and Samsung. HPE acquiring supercomputer pioneer Cray. We probably first talked to you all about Cray when we did a computer history museum tour with Jim Vincent in uh, Silicon Valley, looking at the original Cray supercomputers. But now the discussion for Cray was relating to AMD and Cray working together to build the newest, uh, the most powerful supercomputer, which is Frontier, in the next couple of years. Hewlett Packard Enterprise and Cray have jointly confirmed that HPE will buy the supercomputer maker for $1.3 billion. The president and CEO of HPE stated, quote, answers to some of society's most pressing challenges are buried in massive amounts of data. Only by processing and analyzing this data will we be able to unlock the answers to critical challenges across medicine, climate change, space, and more. And presumably this will also help answer the question of the answer to life, the universe, and everything, which which is probably still 42, but we'll check on that for you. Uh, Cray, in furthering this quote, Cray is a global technology leader in supercomputing and shares our deep commitment to innovation. By combining our world-class teams and technology, we'll have the opportunity to drive the next generation of high-performance computing and play an important part in advancing the way people live and work. Cray got its start in 1972. As stated, it's, it's old. So Cray, the Cray 1 supercomputer, was the biggest item of the time that we were talking about in the computer history museum we have some footage of it they had water-cooled supercomputers as well so water cooling started way back when even before jay's two cents and cray is often associated with the most powerful supercomputers on the planet including the recently announced frontier slated to be the world's first exascale supercomputer hpe will leverage cray and its associated technologies to address the emerging hpc or high performance computing market and the exascale market segment where HPE intends to bolster its HPC as a service offerings. HPE also intends to build an end-to-end -end HPC portfolio consisting of storage, software, compute, and interconnect. This will allow HPE to connect its, or to extend its footprint across a broader set of markets. The last one for this before we actually start the show, Adata and Micron are leapfrogging one another for overclocking records in the space. And this one is for memory overclocking world records. So Micron and Adata seem content to keep trading the crown for the world's fastest kit of DDR4 memory and all of the bragging rights that are afforded therein. So just recently, Micron laid claim to the world record for DDR4 memory frequency with a hardware bot validated record of 5726 megahertz, so over 5.7 gigahertz for memory. And that blows past Adata's previous record of 5634. At this point, every Every one megahertz is a big deal because they're pushing pretty high. Now, Adata is back to leapfrog Micron score, and this moves to an impressive overclock of 5738 megahertz, also validated by HardwareBot. Adata, Adata achieved the overclock with a kit of its own Spectrix D60G RGB DDR4 memory. Now, uh, our theory is presently that they had the RGB set to just red, so that, that probably helped with increasing the score a bit. But again, this is something we'll have to research heavily during Computex and get back to you on. Obviously, these records are set using liquid nitrogen, no surprise, uh, especially on the CPU front. And this is something we've talked about a lot in the past couple of weeks. But aside from the bragging rights, memory makers love these overclocking competitions because it's great self-promotion. For many years, Samsung's BDI memory were, were the ICs of choice for overclockers has been a topic of discussion with the Ryzen processors as, as they've uh, grown in their market prominence. And Samsung is discontinuing its BDI chips this year. So we'll see where the room at the top for the gold standard of memory goes, if it's gonna stay with Samsung or go to one of their competitors. Micron and Adata though are certainly making their case to keep around the high-end memory ICs. So that's it for this news recap. Subscribe for more as always. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly or store.gamersnexus.net. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.